another episode of Screen Heroes. My name is Ray, and I am joined with uh, two other hosts, my favorite lovely, handsome, lovely, handsome host, Ryan. Hi. And Derek. Hello. How are you guys tonight? Good. I'm good. Feels feels good to be back, actually. I'm feeling, feeling good about this one. I feel fine. I'm not really feeling back though. Why were you, why do you feel back, Derek? Is it is it possibly because you had a big trip this weekend? Yeah, we had a busy weekend, so it just kind of feels good to be back to our normal routine. That's all. So gotcha. Yeah, that's good stuff. It's good I stuff. I had fluff in my pants. Don't so we all? all of us. So not we all. all of us. No. Okay. Yeah. Just me then. He's a very hairy man. <laughs> yeah, so let's dive into some news. Sure. We got the pleasantries out of the way. What's some crazy stuff that happened in the world of movies, TV, comics this week? Shazam Gate. No, nothing. From no, there was actually. Was it? What is that? I had a dream about Zachary <laughs> Levi last night. <laughs> And it was really weird because he thought I was like his biggest fan, but I've never seen Chuck, and so I felt like a phony. <laughs> but I still wanted to hang out with him and stuff. It was a very weird dream, and that I don't is know a why. Great update in Chicago. But yeah, that's, maybe that's my favorite. <laughs> so, so let me let me piggyback off that for a moment. So over the weekend, this water is tepid. Tepid. Yes. Well, so I didn't want tepid. it to be too cold or too hot. You wanted it to be just, just right. 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 God. Just like the Goldilocks perfect first waters. Day. Yeah. Uh, no, so over the weekend, uh, one of the panels I did was uh, they call it Trailer Park, where they screen trailers and then talk about them with the audience and stuff like that. And uh, we we watched a, a handful of trailers. We got through like five of them, and the one that m- the people were absolutely by far the most excited for was Shazam. Really? That yeah. is a fun trailer. Yeah. <laughs> this is the full trailer or a TV spot. The full trailer. The full tra- the the first big one that they yeah. they released. So we because we, we watched that Aquaman, Venom, uh, Bumblebee, and How to Train Your Dragon three. I think those it's the ones we got through. It's but. just such a breath of fresh air. I think is what makes it. You know, it's not a Marvel movie. It's not. It, it doesn't seem like the normal DC movies. It's just a nice breath of fresh air. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but it was just kind of cool to see people really positive about that. Everybody's like a big fan of Zachary Levi. Like he just seems like a lovable guy. So you know. Just wanted to throw that out there. Can't so. wait to hug him. That would be cool. I'd, yeah, I would when totally. Are you him? I would totally hug him if that was an option. When, yeah. when are you hugging him? Whenever That's he's ready. Like, are you guys <laughs> seeing him? Ready. Are you guys seeing him at some point, or no. is it just another dream I'm having? Or, <laughs> I'm a fraud, but I want to hang out with him still. Well, you can like him and not know Chuck. I mean, I would yeah. say that if you like him, you should watch Chuck, and you're welcome to borrow it. Uh, yeah, I won't but, ever get around to you it. Know, sad. Putting it in a DVD is a lot of work. <laughs> it really if is. If I could stream it, then I might do it. <laughs> right, if I could stream it, then I might might go for it. But. Okay, yeah. See, back when I started watching it, I had to get the discs from Netflix. But those, it's not on Netflix Those, those are dark times. <laughs> there wow. are still people that use the discs. Yeah, it's I know. crazy. It's like 20% of their ba- user yeah, base. Or something. No, I'm just kidding. Like, clearly, like for those watching, we have a physical collection. So, Anyway, so Swamp Thing, speaking of DC. Yeah, a couple yeah. things. Nice segue there. Yeah. Yeah, right. uh, the guy was cast. Sw- the man in the practical uh, costume is cast. Uh, I think his name is Derek Mears. And he's been in a few other horror films. They slap him in all kinds of prosthetics and big costumes. So he's a good and, choice. Exactly. He yeah. knows how to navigate the body. Very, very unlikely that he's going to do the voice. But at least, you know, we have acknowledgement that somebody's in there and it's, practical and suit. it's a practical suit so that's cool and this guy like you said he, he's done similar stuff before he played um one of the predators in the predators movie a few years back he played uh jason in the friday the 13th reboot um he's played a lot of kind of physically overwhelming characters you know that type physically of thing. imposing imposing player, that's yeah. the word thank you yeah physically imposing characters he played in orion um, from on an episode of Star Trek Enterprise, so just very physical characters. Um, so this is Five not minutes, not bad. Yeah, this is not new to him, so I think it's a I think it's a good choice. Yeah, and then they also we had there was other Swamp Thing news. I think didn't they come out and say that it was a hard R rating? Yeah, yeah. which is interesting. Which so they mean mature because right. it's still TV, right? Okay. 
I was, well, but it's, it's on streaming, streaming so, they, so it's, yeah, yeah. it could be like what they did with Punisher, where it's, I mean, it doesn't have to meet a normal rating, it's mature, but it's a, you know, R would be the, what the rating is. So I imagine um, the R is definitely going to be violence. And most likely, we're going to get a decent amount of cussing. Lots in of plants it. on meat violence, I would assume. Lots of swamp thing, but mm, maybe some. <laughs> I assume. He I has mean, a for butt. a hard R, I want to see swamp thing peen. Like, well, no, the plants don't have peen. Oh, you want to see? Why a would he have a status, a staten or whatever it's called? The <laughs> the plant equivalent. I can't remember what it's. Stamen. Stamen. That's what it is. Yeah. Or his pistol? Well, I think a pistol is yeah. another plant part. Yeah, wow. It is. Yeah, he yeah, probably has all of those plant parts throughout his body, and so he can mate with himself. And yes, I, I don't know if <laughs> that's, that's exactly hilarious. how it works, but uh, I can't believe. It. Yeah, so uh, hard R is interesting because really got really got him. It, it really it, did. Uh, Dave Grohl just join us in chat. Yeah, yeah, we go way back. That's uh, great. <laughs> uh, but the, you know, the Titan show clearly looks like they're going for a mature level rating there as well. Um, Except that that show doesn't really need oh, one. Yeah, not sure. disagreeing. Yeah, uh, this I, I think this doing a hard R with, or a mature rating with Swamp Thing is definitely a, something. I mean, I don't think they need to push that all the time, but for certain certain uh, character traits and things in the show, I think it's yeah. definitely good that they're willing to go that far with it. I mean, it, it shows that if the first two live action shows that they're talking about are both pushing for that hard R. I wonder if Young Justice will be darker than it has been in the first two seasons. It or... doesn't need to be, though. The uh, first two yeah, seasons that's... already had kind of a darker dark, yeah. tone for a kid's show. But, it, you know, you can have dark storylines and not abuse the... Uh, just the language barrier and not increase the violence. Like... They killed off characters in that show. They talked about adult relationships. They dealt with PTSD. Like the show still touched on things that maybe not every child understood. But yeah, I don't think Young Justice needs to go darker. And honestly, if it did get too much darker, I don't think I'd tune in. I don't think it'd be the same show. Yeah, and I'm not saying that I wanted it to be. I was just yes, it, you, you know, were. Hypothesizing. Well, everything DC is dark, so yeah. Well, their next one that they're... it actually stands for dark comics, <laughs> right? Exactly, not dark comics. Yeah. Um, but the the thing is, is that like their next live action show is supposedly Star Girl, and that sh- shouldn't be dark at all, right? Yeah. Okay, so I'm wondering if maybe they're just gonna start with these two, and then it's not totally really a change. good. It's not a great business move though, considering a lot of people's criticism of DC live action stuff is that it's been too dark lately yeah. right so then like maybe you know maybe they should have started with star girl yeah. but again i guess they wanted some name recognition yeah, who knows yeah, maybe knows like star season girl. two they'll change her name to dying star girl yeah there you go you know? and everything will have a sepia filter imploding <laughs> star girl fantastic they did that cast abby arcane too i don't think we talked about that i don't remember the oh, actress's no name idea but she, she uh is. she was sophia falcone on gotham and i thought she was great in that she's not who I would have picked personally, but I'm, yeah. I mean, obviously, she's the casting, and I'm not against it, but... Sure. Um, it makes me think that whoever they're going to get to voice or possibly play... Um, Alec Holland. Yeah, Alec Hall- Holland, excuse me, uh, is going to be a bigger star, you know? Probably, yeah. It's interesting. They like to balance it out. I'm just curious what she's going to look like with white hair. If mm, they that's even kind of an do Abby that. Arcane thing. Yeah. But I guess they could just ignore it. I'd probably be a little upset if they ignored that because it's pretty like that's a big part of her character. I don't know. Anytime they ignore a hair color, when the hair color has canically been outrageous or like noticeably different, like it I don't becomes care a part if, of the yeah. character, right? Like it can be a black actress, it can be you know whatever, right? You know anything, but keep the white hair. I mean, come on, it's... It, it's fun. I mean, they've changed Catwoman's hair so many times, and at this point, I don't even care anymore. It doesn't even matter. <laughs> but uh, for Abby Arcane and like uh, the other white haired superhero storm like yeah. he changed it. it it's noticeable and it's weird yeah yeah it would probably wouldn't obviously affect the quality of the show but i you know come on. small Let's touches like that though resonate with fans yeah give the character some love 
So the only other piece of like superhero type news that we have uh, has to do with the Avengers four quote reshoots. So um, Mark Ruffalo did is his thing, doing his thing. Thanks the rough man. The thing that Tom Holland always gets blamed for, but apparently hasn't actually done. But Mark Ruffalo has is saying stuff you're not really supposed to. So there, these are apparently not reshoots. They're just finishing the movie. And that's not the part that's concerning. If you want to, like, you did that because you wanted to avoid as many spoilers as possible and things like that. I get it. That's risky, but I can it's respect like that. It's like contract negotiations coming up, so they wanted to make sure that they got those out of the way. Had, just like they did with The Walking Dead, where they right. had, like, had it looming over everybody and go, okay, so who wants my, to finish their run here? My concern is what he said about those shoots, about how they could change direction at any time, that they might shoot something and then come back and completely change it. I don't know if that's the studio trying to just film a bunch of different things to confuse people or if they really don't know how this movie is supposed to end yet. Could be one or the other. I think they're probably safeguarding a lot of information to avoid a lot of spoilers just like they did last time. So um, there's rumors that only Benedict Cumberbatch got the original script and nobody's confirmed that even benedict cumberbatch was like i received a script that's all i know <laughs> like i didn't know if it was the script but it's a script yeah I, i'm not sure why they would give like why would you give one actor that script right unless he's just so involved in the movie that they didn't really have a choice i mean i feel like thanos would have to know you know, he would, he would have to know what's going on. They couldn't just not. I don't know. Maybe, script. maybe he's not. Because, like, the Avengers, they're all going to play a little bit of a different role, but he's the only villain. You can't, like. Yeah, they killed off his children. Yeah. But we don't know how much he's in the fourth one. Right? We don't. We don't know anything. Yeah. They, like, the only thing we do know is who's left standing. At the end of Infinity War. Yeah. And that's it. And who's dust. And who's dust? That's Definitely. true. That's true. What a sad opportunity. To play that song? Yeah. They should have. That would have been. <laughs> when Peter Parker doing it. But I don't want to go dust then, in the wind. <laughs> Will Ferrell comes out and he sings it. Like You're an my old boy, school. Blue. Oh my god. This is going off the rails. All right. We should have so, really so, written that movie. Yeah. Mo moving on, uh, just to kind of stick with, I guess, Disney stuff. The best selling blu-ray it's been the last jedi in so what i think happened <laughs> is so many angry people were like yeah let's uh let's crap on the movie and we'll tell all of our friends not to go see it and then those people didn't go see the movie and now they rented it they loved it and they're buying it that's what I think is happening, is that it hit Netflix and people are like, you know what, those people were just being jerks. It's a huge possibility. Um, I'm a little surprised. I still stand by it. I, I do too, that it, Leia and Mary Poppins will be the not biggest being a jerk. betrayal of my life. <laughs> now let's, let's be a little bit fair in that The Last Jedi is also like the one movie of 2018 people have had the most opportunity to buy. Yeah. Because right? it released really... in December. So yeah. the Blu-ray came out like when Black Panther came yeah, out in theaters. Theory. Right. So it's, it's had a pretty good head start. Number one. Um, and you know, like infinity war just came out like a month ago. Yeah. Right. Not even. Um, and, and you know, that one's his best competition at this point. Yeah, I, mean, I would have thought that Black Panther was going to be, given oh, how Infinity successful Wars, it was in the theater. Infinity War is a bigger movie than but, Black Panther. Well, right, but what I mean by that is, if like I assumed Black Panther was going to outsell The Last Jedi. But even so, even Black Panther hasn't had that much time. I mean, it hasn't been out on Blu-ray. Yeah, or, I guess you're probably you know, right. Well, no, it came out like a week or two after Infinity War hit theaters. I mean, I remember it's still not that much time. No, I, I just I remember specifically being kind of annoyed by that like you couldn't have moved it up a week so people could rent it before seeing infinity yeah. war um i'm sure they had their reasons but uh i don't know i um i just thought that was weird the last jedi being the best selling movie of 2018 on blu-ray yeah i don't know maybe i mean we didn't buy it <laughs> no did you did you oh, okay. Oh, okay i don't i haven't bought a blu-ray or any kind of physical media in probably 10 years we don't yeah. buy that much anymore. And with Marvel, we actually have we buy the phase box sets. So we're waiting for this phase box set to come out, which 
I don't know if that will ever happen, I guess, at this point. Right. It would be cool if it came in a gauntlet, since you had the briefcase with the Tesseract, you had the orb, the orb. from Guardians. I guess the gauntlet's like the next thing, right? Yeah. yeah. Could yeah. be. I don't know. All right, anyway, moving on. The she trailer dropped. Teaser trailer dropped. It looks fun. It looks like a fun show. I have a, I watched it, but without sound because I was at work when it came out, and it looked. Yeah. I mean, I really like the art style. I'd really like to see a He Man mm-hmm. done in the same art style. You know, I think that would be really cool. But um, the transformation looked cool. I mean, mm-hmm. everything looked pretty cool. The sword is neat looking. Yeah. I like that animation style. It looks modern. It looks crisp. The you know. only thing is I wish it were coming out just a few weeks early because I kind of want to make that costume for my oldest niece for mm. Halloween. And since it comes out the week after Halloween, yeah. it's not going to happen. You can still make it. I know, I could. Yeah, You're just she, making excuses. She won't, the, I mean, but she won't know what it is yet. <laughs> exactly. She's never seen the original. She'll just be wearing the you know. costume. I don't even know if the original is available anywhere to watch. I'm sure it is. It's the it, things go on the internet and then they are there. Well, that's true. Yes, there are illegitimate ways to watch it. I'm sure. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I think it looks good. I'm looking forward to watching it. Uh, I hope it creates some some other you know, Gray Skull universe type stuff. I think could yeah. be really cool. To kind of a lot of out. people are like, I don't even care until I see Hordak, and I'm like, you understand. Catra is going to be the main antagonist for right, at least the Hordak. first five to ten episodes. Probably the entire maybe first, season. first season. Yeah. Is it a thirteen episode season? Yeah. Okay. That's pretty standard now. So I was just curious. Talking uh, about Shira costumes, I did think it's cool. Shuri has her has a costume, and you can you can get at a uh, just Walmart or whatever. Oh, that's yeah. awesome. That's cool. Kind of neat. Yeah. And this is the first Halloween since. Black Panthers come out, so mm-hmm. you know, I'm just trying to see that stuff. But yeah, Shuri. Yeah. It's really I'm cool really one. excited I hope I to see, some see of those. A, yeah. Like Scare it this year. Maybe we'll see a few. Oh, that'll mm-hmm. be fun. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. I'll be sporting uh the Buster Props muscle suit. Will you? Yeah. That's the plan anyway. Good lord. <laughs> Are you you're doing Mr. Incredible? No. No. Oh. No. Eventually. Else. Eventually. Okay. But not not for scare. You'll have to tell me later. So. We're gonna keep it secret. Yeah. We'll keep oh, it safe. Yours. Um, all right, so we'll, we'll keep going. We'll fin- wrap up news here in a couple of minutes because it's going a little long. But uh, Jordan Peele is looking to reboot Candyman. Now, if you loved the original Candyman, it was most likely because of the actor who played him and not because of the film because it was rough in places. And Jordan Peele is incredibly talented, so I'm looking forward to this. I'm hoping the original actor has a cameo and they they... Uh, have an homage to him. I don't expect him to be the main guy in this. I don't expect them to bring him back like they did with uh, Robert England all those times. But I do expect him to have a little homage. So that would, would be nice. It would be cool if they could find some in-universe explanation for it being a continuation with a new Candyman. Like you could have, you know, maybe some type of passing of the torch would be pretty neat. Yeah, I mean, he was just kind of a demon, so there's no reason why there couldn't be multiple sure. in this world. Or, or he could regenerate in some way or yeah. something. You know, I just, I, I like when... All of a sudden versus... it's evil Doctor Who. Like, I love that. <laughs> not like that. I just, I like when universes are allowed to continue. Like, I appreciate, like it or not, I appreciate what they try to do with Tron, right? The idea that these universes are still happening and we're just not necessarily seeing all the stories in between. No, I love that. You know? I... I've wanted to see what I like to see what else is going on in the world during these big films. Like if North America has become Pan Am and we do the Hunger Games, what is going on in Australia and Europe and uh, Mm -hmm. Asia? Like, you know, the rest of the world can't be that much better off. There's no way they're having a utopia and we're, you know, having a this whole dystopian society where most of our citizens are starving to death. So the rest of the world's just watching us. Yeah. <laughs> They're fine. Um, no, I, I, sequels and prequels and reboots are very popular because people like the rain, name recognition. It makes you feel comfortable. Yeah, you've already had all this time and, uh, in free and free ish advertising, you know, right. from the previous media of whatever kind. Yeah. That's going to be set for that. So I, I totally get it. I just, Starting over from scratch just always feels a little unfortunate. That's all. Yeah. You know, just kind of erase everything. Speaking of reboots and remakes, I send you guys the article about Thundercats. 
What about yeah. it? About the rumor that Michael Bay is actually filming a new Thundercats movie right now under a code name and it hasn't been announced? There's an I mean, actor that is also like rumored to be attached to yeah. it too, and it might be a Netflix show or yeah, Netflix it's a movie. Yeah, it's a Netflix movie or something like that, yeah. Michael Bay hasn't done anything good for the world. Since Bad Boys 2, right? Since Bad Boys 2. Yeah, the early Boy, 2000s. did Armageddon come out? Armageddon came out before Bad Boys. Yeah. 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 Um, so, okay, that's interesting, because he's been pretty quiet. Yeah. Recently. But he's been and wanting been, to do yeah, that they, they, for years. over 10 years yeah. now. It Ever ex- since he ruined Transformers, he decided. <laughs> he's got to ruin another yeah. one. Uh, but it does explain why he's been so quiet, though. Because if they're trying to keep this under wraps as some type of big surprise. I think it's because people like us sit around every single day and talk about how horrible he is. Why wouldn't he want to keep that quiet? If yeah, that can was... you imagine what the internet will blow up if, like... Netflix comes out and says, Thundercats, watch it now. And, like, there's nothing. Do you remember the cartoon, like, just six months ago with the announcements? Like, they don't have up Fan Boys tore that apart. It's not going to be a Netflix movie. It, it would be more Maybe. likely a Netflix. Michael Bay wouldn't direct a TV show. I <laughs> no, no. No, I imagine he would make, like, a three hour movie and they would split it apart. In or like six like episodes. Where it's like four yeah. episodes or I just don't see Netflix giving him the budget he would need. Not enough explosion budget. Well, I mean, Bright's budget was only like sixty or ninety million, which I mean, to us, of course, is a fortune, right? But when you look at a normal motion picture, one sixty-five is on the low end of that spectrum today. Mm-hmm. You know, like I, I don't know. Maybe he's funding some of it out of his own pocket. Maybe he has other investors, other producers. There's no way to know. The thing is, like, even though we all think it's crap, Transformers movies keep making money, so they keep so throwing the him projects. Movies, unfortunately. Like, yeah. he, they keep throwing him projects. Well, so. Bumblebee looks like it is taking a drastically different approach. <laughs> He's not directing it, though. That's true. He's just producing It's it. just That's in fair. his world, yeah. so... And we don't know where it takes place, so everybody wants to go see it because of the where's and the when's and... Well, it takes place in the 80s. I know that much. Okay, so, so. well before Sam w- Wiki That's right. ever came into our lives. <laughs> That's true. Um, all right, well, anyway, we've spent a Dare little... Daredevil release day. Oh, okay. Daredevil's yeah, releasing in October. October, yeah, I think it was 19. 19. Yeah, there was a release on the Thai Netflix... Because they all really... All the Twitters released the trailer for Daredevil Season 3, which plays at the end of Iron Fist Season 2. And when they released it, they said, join us on October 19th or something along those lines. And uh, everybody, you know, latched onto that real quick. That's so early. It's it awesome. They don't have faith in Iron Fist. Yeah, they need somebody to carry it through the winter. It's an interesting it's concept. Pleasure, yeah. Well, when you look at the order of only 10 episodes versus the normal 13 and only one month apart between releases, yeah, they have no faith in Iron Fist. This Having is... watched... Six or seven episodes of season two. I'm not gonna, where I know we're reviewing it next week, so I'm not yeah. going to get too deep into it. But it is much better than the first season. So yeah. I've heard that from everybody. We'll the see. problem is not a lot of people are willing to give it a yeah, chance. second chance. Yeah. Well, I mean, Finn Jones and Mike Coulter both want to do Heroes for Hire. So Please maybe, let that happen. maybe that's the goal here. That's what I think they should do. You know? Just recycle IPs and merge shows. And... and then they can add some new characters. You know? yeah. Moon Look, Knight. Their chemistry together it, um, in season two of Luke Cage was fantastic. Yeah. And if they both want to do it and Iron Fist isn't hitting the standards that people want it to hit, then just go do it. Yeah. yeah. You know, it seems like a no brainer. I just wonder if they're scared to do that because then they get one less show out of it because Netflix's deal with Marvel then, right now and Disney because they're doing their own streaming service. I know yeah. they get their adult ones, but Disney might be like, no, you're not getting any extra shows. So, so then they do the spinoff Daughters of the Dragon and they have the exact same amount of shows. Yeah. You know? They've got I mean, the characters. So. Yeah. Or they, but Disney may not let them. That's true. You know, that's, that's unfortunate. Yeah, I, I, we don't really know the the legalities of that, other than if it's going to be mature rated, it, gets, it goes on Netflix. And if there's so. anything in the world that stifles creativity, 
It's copyright legality. <laughs> so yeah, we don't have to wait much more than a month for Daredevil season three, which yeah, is really exciting. Nice. I know I've been very much looking forward yeah. to it ever since the ending of Defenders. I, I have know to refresh and, myself uh, a little bit on season two. It's been a while. You, you should, and you John with Defenders. Buster Props are just waiting for those photos. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I don't think he's going to get a real new, a big new suit or anything. You know, maybe a new cowl every two episodes. In season two. Suit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, he got lots of new stuff in season two, so I'm hoping it slows down a little bit. Yeah. You know. But, yeah, so we don't have to wait very long, which is exciting. Although he is in his vigilante suit for most of this one, which is... That is me. The superior suit. Or is he? Or is it his <laughs> doppelganger? Okay, so we're going to take this opportunity to take a small commercial break, because we have sold out, Mofo. No, it's just a promo for one of our other shows. No, we'll we're be right back, out. guys. Sold out. Are you with the Force? Is the Force with you? Well, the Force is with us over at the Echo Station Podcast, a new Star Wars series from the Heroes Podcast Network. Join us in a galaxy not so far away every other Monday as we discuss everything Star Wars from the original films through the whole EU. So pour yourself some blue milk and get cozy in that tauntaun with the Echo Station Podcast. Find out more at heroespodcast.com. Okay, we're back, everybody. Hey! So, uh, the topic for this week, if you're not aware, is what, Ray? The 1960s uh, time machine. So, I realized a little while ago that for all of us being huge cinephiles, we have gaps in our collection and our viewing history that we wanted to share with each other. So, we've been picking movies that are important to us or maybe have flown under the radar or maybe we're taking... This is an opportunity to see a new movie that has slipped by personally. Or the opportunity to troll the other two hosts into watching something that you know is terrible but they've never seen. Oh, so that's Ryan. No, not necessarily. That's, that's what so Ryan's going to do next month. So, uh, <laughs> for those who may not know, I, I am a sci-fi guy. That's my thing. and You're the sci-fi. Well, I'm the Star Trek dude. I feel like the sci-fi but, guy is your knockoff. Yeah, like, exactly. I'm pretty sure that handle is taken. I think I follow that person. <laughs> it's the uh, Hydrox. Yep. But anyway, <laughs> Hydrox was first. And your Oreo, that's what we're saying. Yeah. Right? Oh, that's so sweet. Well, you killed I didn't say that Hydrox. She said that, but yeah. Anyway, continue. Um, anyway, uh, so so I wanted to go with a movie that I've been watching most of my life that kind of helped form my opinion of science fiction and the, that whole genre, uh, which is... The H.G. Wells' The Time Machine from 1960. Um, it's a adaptation on H.G. Wells' novella, The Time Machine. It's pretty close. It's certainly not exact. There's a certain there's like an epilogue in the novella that's clearly not in the movie um, and things like that. But it's pretty close considering. Um, and uh, that's that's what we're going to be talking about. There have been at least two other versions of The Time Machine in 2002. Uh, with Guy Pierce, and then in 1978, which I've never seen. There was also an adaptation in the, in 1944 on BBC. Oh. Um, the director, uh, George Powell, mm -hmm. is that his name? He wanted to do a sequel, and he died before it happened, so somebody else picked it up and made a TV movie uh, sequel to it. So it's a pseudo sequel because it's yeah. also a documentary. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of behind the scenes stuff. Michael J. Fox actually shows up in it, which is kind of cool. Um, and a few of the uh, actors from the original, Rod Taylor and Alan Young, are both in it, along with some others. Yeah. So it's got kind of a rich history to it. Um, so just a couple of, of small, like little fun facts. Uh, it had a really small budget for the time, about $750,000. No. But it ended up pulling in uh, almost 5.7 million worldwide, which is well, pretty solid. Well, that's a solid. huge return. Yeah, um, three and a half domestically. So it did a pretty good job, especially you know for that time period, mm -hmm. um, which is pretty cool. It did win an Academy Award for Best Effects in 1961, which is uh, which is somewhat surprising um, when you you know watch some of those special effects and you think about how they held up over the years. Um, but it, uh, and it was nominated for a Hugo Award, but it did not win the Hugo Award. But it was nominated, which is kind of neat. And a lot of the props uh, are actually reused from the uh, film Forbidden Planet, which is a uh, older sci-fi film from the 50s um, that actually starred Leslie Nielsen. 
bonus fact right. right there. When he was a serious actor, not the naked gun airplane guy. That's right. <laughs> Seriously, like he had a whole career before that, and people don't know. He did, yeah. Or they don't care. Or they, they don't, don't care, care. yes. Um, all right, so the time machine. Uh, quick synopsis. Guy, it's uh, December 31st, 1899. Guy builds a time machine. His friends don't believe him. He goes forward in time, sees all the horrors and destruction of humanity. and uh... So he continues to go forward <laughs> until it's the year 802,733 or something like that. 701. 701. I had to write it down. I was... Yeah. Don't have to memorize it. Um, it's been parodied a bunch of times, you know, mm-hmm. Futurama's parodied it, uh, Big Bang Theory had a whole episode about the time machine, prop, and things like that. Um, so, guys, what did you think? Any thoughts? It's okay, you didn't have to like it. Had you, you hadn't seen it before, though? I had it. no. I had only seen the Guy Pierce version in 2002. Have you seen that one? No. Okay, just curious. It was, I mean, it was well made. Uh, I think I'm just I'm just because of my age a spoiled consumer of <laughs> media that I, um, I I I feel like I had ADHD watching it because it was very slow and and a lot of movies were back then from what I understand and so it's just what cinema has become mm-hmm. now has kind of spoiled me to a movie that that has such a slow pace. Um, but it was very well made. I can definitely appreciate the amount of work that went into it. The acting was really better than I thought it would be. Um, so I, I was pleasantly surprised overall. Will I watch it again? Probably not. But um, it's cool that I have watched it now. Right. I found the main character spoiled and unrelatable. I thought he was misogynistic and needing to be the hero. They were all almost all misogynistic, though. Other right. Than, like, all all the guys, yeah. Um, they were pretty much all misogynistic. But, I think that was um, like a sign of the times. He seemed to get a huge boner off of rescuing these Eloy. I'm sorry. They're useless people. They should die. Like, <laughs> oh, they, how do they live this long? Right? That's what I want to know. The, well, Morlocks the, the Morlocks are Morlocks doing... Take care of them. Right, but they, it took like half their population... In that one go. Yeah, I mean, we don't get a good look they at that. They may be like cannibal monsters, but they are industrious. They are clearly really good ranchers. They're like, the superior race. Clearly. <laughs> okay, well, that's clearly. Uh, like, we're going down a bad no. path. <laughs> they were the heroes in this whole movie. H.G. Wells came from the working class. He wrote this knowing that the working class works underground. Yes. They they are the bakers. They are the, the coal ha- miners. Yeah, yeah. There there was clearly <laughs> there was clearly a point being made when he gets to the future. Yes, right. So I'm just I didn't find our hero relatable because he feels the need to be the white knight and rescue. It's it's one thing to rescue the the one Eloy from drowning. I mean, I would have done that, too. I would have tried to help this person. I have tried to rescue someone from drowning before. It, I get that the Eloy are useless people because they have no curiosity and no willingness to go outside of their comfort zone. You know, they don't care where they get their food. They don't care. They just know they can't go out at night. So I I get that they're a useless race, but um, I... I don't see why he felt the need to go back just because his friends didn't believe him. No, like, that's not why he well, goes it, back. Well, it seemed like he fell in love with this woman yeah. that just five seconds ago he called a child. Like, oh, you are a child. Like, that's disgusting. It's weird. You are disgusting, it's sir. It's super weird. She is mentally about a six-year-old and you fell in love with her? You are gross. It's that part is very weird. The point I think the point that bring on the Guy Pierce movie. Okay. Wow. Okay. Well, so the the crux of the the, the, the... machine itself was really cool. Would it have changed anything if Adrian Brody was? <laughs> <laughs> no, because he's usually a really crappy kind of person. Like he in real life, he he's not a predator. He's not a monster. He's not a racist. He's just a douchebag. Like, right. So, I mean, the, the idea is that uh, 
he George feels out of his own time. He doesn't feel like he fits in. He's not supposed to have any kind of love interest where he is, no family, no real attachments. His friends are even somewhat distanced from him except for um, Alan's character. For some reason, the actor's name is stuck in my head. Philby. Thank you. Um, Who's the only actual good person pretty much in the whole movie. He's a wonderful oh, the, the, person. The older woman. Yeah, I guess. And Mrs. Watch It. Watch It, thank yeah. you. Yeah, she's, what a she dumb is. last name. Like, if that wasn't on the damn note. Her nose. sister was Who's It. <laughs> no, well, it's not, I don't think that's... It's, it's the, the clocks everywhere. That's yeah. the joke. <laughs> Um, but the point is, he's, he her wants first name to, is Timepiece. Right. Yeah, sorry. Uh, she, he wants to leave that time period, and I think in his perspective, he just doesn't fit in where he is. Don't get me wrong. Be... I like the beginning of the movie, and it's because I like the motivation that he wants to live in a world without war. That yes. He's hoping that one day humans are good enough. To not fight each other. See, I got more that he was just interested in like where tech would be at a certain point, not not that. But I mean, yeah, I just too. Mis- he mis- didn't like that the technology was always being used just to make the next best weapon. Yeah, right. I mean, he wanted true. technology to, to advance to the to the point. Like he wanted, he, to be, he wanted up, to show up to Star Trek, Starfleet. Yes, and, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So when he shows up and first sees the Eloy, he thinks that we've reached this utopia where machines just take care of everything and we can just do whatever we want. That's completely Aryan, everyone. Well, yes. Um, but the point none of us would be there. No, no, nope. not at all. Uh, but the the point the it point been like is Sparta right. That kicked us off the edge of the edge because we don't have blonde <laughs> enough hair. The, the the Morlocks are still the bad guys though because they're essentially cannibals who are slaughtering these people. They're not cannibals because they're not human. I mean, maybe humans are like cows to them. Are we cannibals? Okay, let's put it this way then. It would be like if we were eating chimps. Like they, you know, the they t- do in some places. Yeah. and I think that's weird, don't you? The it's two weird, but not cannibals. Are, like. The humans evolved. They evolved into two completely different forms. And we lost our intelligence in both. Mm -hmm. We lost our humanity, for lack of a better word, our kindness. And I think that is... You know, the problem, I don't think that was a good future. I don't think he should have destroyed the Morlocks. I don't think he should have gone back. I think maybe he should have, you know, stuck around at a different point and tried to make the world better where he is. Instead of just trying to convince these three, four guys that he was capable, I I think... Yeah, that unfortunately would break the time travel because that's why Philby keeps the house and makes the monument to him and things like that because he expects him to come back at some point. Yes. And he can't come back or none of that would have been that way. And so it would have changed his time travel to begin with and that that whole side story that goes on there with, you know, the the son and everything. Um, I mean, this is an old story, right? That's, That's part of the narrative is that this is an old concept and he, you know, the idea is he's saving the more human creatures compared to the monsters down below. Is is the idea, right? Yeah. So it's it's very kind of he's on the nose. choosing the lesser race because they're prettier, right? Like I, I mean, to an extent, he likes children. They're pretty, pretty children. <laughs> they're, they're also peaceful, whereas the Morlocks are not. He doesn't Until like, he turns them violent. Keep in mind, he doesn't. Yeah, like, that one guy like starts hitting yeah, him for yeah. the very first time. So now, who do you think he's going to hit next, walk. Derek? In the 1960s, obviously George. <laughs> uh, no, but my, my point, my point is, is that um, I do like that the character's name is H. George Wells. Yes. That was cool. Well, and if you look on the time machine, it's it a, says property we all saw of it, Easter eggs. <laughs> um, anyway. The, the, po- the point that I'm trying to make, though, is that he doesn't like violence and war and that type of thing. And he sees the Morlocks as being the violent species here, the violent race, whatever you want to call them. And he doesn't like that, and he wants to put an end to that. They also stole his time machine, and that ticked him off quite a bit, too. Um, so, you know, at the end of the day, maybe if they hadn't taken his time machine, he would have gone home, and that would have been the end of it. You know, because um, he went to go get the time machine, and he couldn't get it back, and that's how he ends up with Yeah, he Mino did more. end up hating the Eloy. You know, but then they're kind of his savior, so to speak, um, and he's saving them and, and things of that nature. So, you know, 
but there's a lot more to the movie that we're kind of skipping over, right? So you have um, all the stuff in the middle that we didn't talk about. It, but I, that's how I feel like the time machine goes. Like we just talk. Like, even H.G. Wells, he when he writes, he writes about the middle stuff very little, and the important part is the Eloy and the Morlocks, you know? So I couldn't help, the whole time I was watching this movie, because the movie's very dialogue-heavy. Yes. yes. I couldn't help, I, I want Quentin Tarantino to remake this movie, but <laughs> not, okay, like, with the racial undertones and things like that and that he feet. likes to throw into his movies, and no feet. Like, he's just this dialogue really well in, in, in an interesting way. Yeah. And I feel like some of the scenes that were slow, for me, would have been a lot better with a director that, a modern day director that uh, knows more about dialogue framing yeah. and... Uh, I would know, much rather have cut. Samuel L. Jackson explain to me what the three dimensions are. Right? <laughs> yeah. You know, like, oh, the, the overweight dude... Go up, the... motherfucker! <laughs> then you go down! <laughs> Oh, God. Uh, but it's an interesting point that when you think about the time of the film, where like almost the entire first half of the movie just takes place at the house. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I do but have a that, question. That is smart because it saved on all of the sets. sets. Yeah, and money was a big yeah. factor here. And that time machine is a fantastic looking prop. It looked cool. Like there's so. I'm yes, not saying it, it was functional. It, yes, it did, but I kind of wonder why somebody that's an inventor would would just like add a little crystal to the top of the <laughs> like handle, or like make a door that just nicely, you know. And then every never inventor, use it again. yeah, um. every inventor that's ever been portrayed in a movie has. So... <laughs> like Doc Brown, right? Like shit's sh- just thrown together, and we pray to God it holds together. No, works. no, hang on. He's just very refined. Doc, Doc picked the DeLorean because if you're going to travel through time, you should do it in style, right? And the okay. stainless steel chassis helps with a lot of things. <laughs> but, but I mean, the back of it, where you see the tech, is all all looks cobbled together. You're right, but there's no I diamonds. Took the, I always took the diamond or the crystal or whatever it is as being part of the mechanical structure of it. it on the end of the handle, <laughs> I don't know. It's like having a no, eight wait, ball shift knob. <laughs> Right? I mean, that's I mean, basically what it is. I think you're both, I think you're exaggerating a little bit. I think well, that we don't. Well, for fun, we. No, we, I know, but we, we don't really we're know. speculating. We don't really know how it functions at all. It's got that giant, you know, uh, plate behind it that spins and little lights that light up and like, stuff like that. I it mean, was very pretty. And clearly, that guy spent years learning how to upholster velvet. Right? Like and that. yeah, I think he just bought a chair. Damn it, Derek. He probably did. But he also <laughs> bought an eight ball shift knob, so. Anyway, um, I had a question for you guys. Sure, sure, sure. How did you feel about the movie essentially beginning with him showing up having done most of the adventure already? It did get me curious. I wanted to know exactly where he was going with this, but it, that, from what I've read on my homework, um, it's a pretty faithful part of the book as well so or the novella but from like a storytelling standpoint i mean it's tough because again it's uh you know i've seen movies where they do that similar thing since then so it wasn't like a brand new concept to me obviously in the 60s it probably was but it's it's cool i appreciate it when it's done well and it was done well so see i actually don't like it Oh, really? Because it kills the suspense. So this whole thing was a setup so that you could talk about it. No, I assumed you guys wouldn't like it either. Really? It it kills the suspense of the film. I disagree. Because everything that happens before he comes back, you know he's going to make it. Yeah, but I assumed from the beginning that he wasn't in any danger. But you didn't know what was going to happen to him. You didn't know if he was going to get stuck in some other time or... When the, when the Morlocks steal the time machine, you don't know how he's going to get it back. And, right. You know, there's all these different things that could happen. If you don't know that he makes it back, it does enhance the suspense. You I know? guess. I think my stupid brain works in the way that, like, oh, okay, at the beginning, he is all messed up. He's got cuts and ripped clothing and blood in places, and he's very dirty. Let's see if that's consistent with how his injuries are at the end of the movie. So that's how terrible I am. Okay. I just want to look for that's where I was too, to be honest with you. And and because Dave Grohl in chat has ish, has likes us nitpicking, I do have a nitpicky. Well, time I mean that's what we're thing. here for. Oh, please. Uh, so <coughs> excuse me. Um, at the end, when he comes back, 
Any like moves? Shouting. Yeah, I was wondering. <laughs> I was wondering if they would have have it have the time machine show up in his garage or whatever that is again. Oh, right. right. They didn't. So I was happy about that. Yeah. But clearly, when you see him, his time machine taken by the Morlocks or whatever, it's taken up a hill sure. and into a building. Well, when it comes back, it's sitting flat on flat ground. There's no hill or nothing like no. that. So because the hill wasn't there. Okay, but but the time machine would have still stayed that high. It would have fallen to the ground. Yeah, it and, would have fallen to the ground. But it, did you see? So you don't watch Futurama, so no. you haven't seen this in action. But no, like, the hill wasn't there eight hundred thousand years earlier, so it just would have dropped a few feet, whatever that was. Right, but he didn't. There was there was no sign of impact. There was nothing showing that. I don't know. I, or or you know maybe it was a situation where his house was higher up. And it had lowered over time. Okay, that's another thing I had a problem with was, wow, these volcanoes and lava are going, you know, everything's going off. It's really lucky that this wall just built up directly next to him and never no, no, actually no. took over. So that's not what happens. Because he never stops in there. I know he never stops in there, but it clearly shows... Well, that's just 60 special effects. But the idea is that it's all there. If he were to stop, he dies. I, just I get that this the wrong. idea, but I can only go off of what is actually shown in the movie. Okay. And it's very weird, like, logic jump that all this stuff would happen around him. Or, like, all the bombs and stuff going off. He's seeing destruction, like, 15 feet away, buildings collapsing. And it's still green grass, beautiful weather, and his time machine's just sitting there completely unhurt in this Well, because as floor. long as he keeps moving... But no, like, this was when he was... Oh, you, you mean you mean during the bombing? When yeah. He, yeah, that's the silly part. Yeah, <laughs> I was like, okay, this, he's just really lucky with where he parked his time machine, I oh, guess. Oh, yeah, the whole city just got nuked, and he's just kind of rolling around the grass in, in the yard. The grass is still green, you know? Yeah. It's, yeah, the time machine untouched, no well, lava. That, that no part nothing. you're totally right about. That you're absolutely right about. But anything that happens while he's moving through time doesn't affect him or the machine. Okay. Well, I, they did I think touch on that in the 2002 they one did. because they Jeremy did. Irons jumps into the time machine and Guy Pierce kicks him out and he watches his body decay as he's going forward and that's kind of cool to watch. Yeah. They, for the record, I know you don't like it, but that 2002 remake was directed by the great great grandson of H.G. Wells, which is really cool, right? My, my... Like that's just that's really fun. And Alan Young does appear. In that, so does H.G. Wells in a little picture. Well, look, the, the, the main reason that I don't like the 2002 film is the motivation for the time machine. Yes, in because the 1960... you're cold inside and don't believe no. in love. In the 19... That is actually true about Derek, fun fact. In the 1960 version, as well as the book, he creates a time machine out of scientific curiosity because he is an inventor. And in the 2002 film, they made it that his wife dies and he wants to save her. And the problem is, is that the way time travel is used in these movies, he can't do that. No, we get to watch her die multiple times. And so it changes the entire point of the film. The point of the film now is his regret of not being able to save his wife instead of his, his wish to find humanity's peak of, of civilization. That he is an inventor and he built this to see if it could be done to prove that it was possible. It changes the character completely for me. And yeah, the special effects are much better and the detail is oh, better because no. it's a modern no. film. But that's not what's important. I'm not to me. judging the film on the special effects. There were movies that yeah, came before it them. that did it much better, and there are movies that have come after that have done it much worse. So I'm not the judging. Stop motion stuff was actually pretty good. I it thought was like fun. the uh, when when the Morlock or whatever they're called was like decaying, decaying, yeah. and then yeah. come back. I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. But then you had also the like lava scene where it's clearly like hot hot wheels they threw into yeah. into red water uh oatmeal okay actually it's oatmeal. yeah uh no you're right about that stuff uh one quick thing about the the time um the um the stop motion a lot of the stuff uh the scenery and things like that the flowers were actually paintings That's, that yeah. were shot picture I feel by like picture i could kind of tell I don't know. It looked very flat. You yes, could, like, yeah. you could you could tell, but it's still an interesting, clever. like clever it's, way of doing it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and there's some really bad matte painting stuff in there. But again, we we saw that bad matte so painting common. stuff in the '90s. Still, yeah. you know, um, one of the things I love about movies is trying to pick apart practical effects. Like how yeah. how do they actually accomplish that? In this movie, it's not as hard in older movies no, a lot of no. the time. So I didn't get you know the thrill of figuring it out with this one. But it was interesting to see how things were done because I don't want to watch watch a lot of movies from that era so yeah and i mean there, there's not a whole lot for them to do most of it is like you were saying dialogue it's conversation right and i mean the morlocks i guess for 1960 looked fine 
I actually yeah, liked them. They, I thought it was pretty, pretty good. Pretty yeah. impressive. Uh, the lights in the eyes. That was cool. It was, I always liked it was that. well done. And the fight scenes, actually, especially if you compare it to what Star Trek fight scenes were like just a few years later, the fight scenes in this movie were actually pretty good. The, the scene with the yeah. Warlock on fire was probably yeah. my most, the scene I was most impressed with, because every time he like ran off camera, I was like, okay, the fire's done. And then he run back in the frame <laughs> yeah. and do it some more, and then he's like, okay, he's done now. Nope, then he's coming back out for a third pass. I'm like, that, that dude is pretty did not crazy. get paid enough. Like, that was a latex suit, I imagine, with a lot of, like... I think he was wearing like, a fire suit and just well, the mask. God, if you I look hope at so. it, like, it's, I uh, hope so. it's clearly, like, clothing probably fireproof clothing but the mask is still there and i mean that's yeah. i don't want to wear a latex mask without fur, fire like it i actually thought a lot of that was really well done and the time machine has kind of become an iconic prop you know that that uh is pretty easy to pick out there's not really anything else that looks like it which i've always appreciated that it's very different you know most time machines that you see in movies and tv shows and stuff move like the delorean yeah right but this one doesn't it straight up doesn't move you're stuck I, wherever it is i love that aspect of it i love that there was a caveat to his travel because um i did think that was an interesting yeah, mechanic it, not something i never really thought about it keeps the story interesting in my opinion um and maybe it's because H.G. Wells, like, kind of invented our modern concept of what a time machine actually is. And other stories developed that and added the whole moving through space also. But I just thought it was a neat uh, story plot. I like it because, you know, it, it does force him to work around those factors, right? Mm -hmm. Like, when the bombs go off, he can't go away from them. Yeah. He just has to go past them. And, you know, that mountain could maybe never, you know, uh, decay enough for him to get out or erode enough for him to get out. Um, that would have made for a boring film. Of course. Uh, you know, but uh, it's, it's a cool idea. I always liked that. Um, I always thought it was cool. The little model, I always wish that somebody made that, like, in production so I could buy one. Yeah, you I know, would definitely buy one. Did. I mean, by hand, yeah. But, like, I mean, like... NECA or somebody, you know, Eagle Moss, somebody out there make a model that I can buy for, you know, 20, 30, 40 bucks, something like 50 bucks, you know. Yeah, um, I'd buy that. Like the DeLoreans, it's... you know, that, that are pretty readily available. Yeah. Um, but, uh... I can see how it's iconic. Not quite as iconic in a pop culture sense. Right. No, like, no. Important, but yeah. not iconic. I feel like the time machine is not, like, the movie is not iconic but the entire story is in the history and how it's been uh, adapted. Like I, we have talked about the novella and the 1960s and the 2002 movie, and I think that all of them together are fairly iconic. And as sci-fi and fantasy fans, we can definitely see the roots that this whole story has uh, helped create our modern day concept of sci-fi. So I can definitely appreciate what happened with it, where it's coming from. I just, at some point, the hero becomes unlikable to me. Yeah, and there was, yeah, the character characters were not written in a way that was, I didn't identify with any of them other than uh, Philby, I guess, yeah. because I, everybody wants to be the nicer guy, and he was the only one that seemed like he was even remotely likable. Well, because he seemed normal. Because yeah. the other three guys but are these super... But at the same super... time, like, he's not just normal. He wants to believe his friend. He, yeah. he wants to support his efforts and things like that. He just, like... Throughout time. like Yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Lifetime. Um, enough, so much so that even his son creates a memorial for that friendship that's and knows important. about the guy yeah, yeah. But that's how important that was and, and I, I like that how many of us would be okay with that like if all of a sudden let's say Derek turns 45 and he decorates our house in nothing but clocks and time pieces like I think Ryan and I would both think that you were bonkers and we... or an inventor I would ask if he has a DeLorean in the garage <laughs> oh, man. or a giant amp anywhere I can dream a giant amp and speaker I can dream. Uh, so that's where we're going. He's right. just done and daydreaming I just want now. A DeLorean. Anyway, um, no, the, the movie is important for classic science fiction. It was at an era of when sci-fi was still relatively new. Of course, you the fifties were really when things took off with movies like The Forbidden Planet and Lost in Space, the TV the show. Exactly. Yeah, there was some big stuff, and the sixties is where things really started to 
you know, become colorized. And, you know, Star Trek came out of this a few years later, just five, five, uh, six years later. And, uh, you know, this was old storytelling, old movie style. Mm-hmm. Um, but it does some, some interesting stuff. I think it holds up pretty well compared to other movies from that time. I think a movie yeah. like Forbidden Planet, which is also one of my favorite classic sci-fi films, doesn't hold up quite as well. Now it's about ten year, no, about five years older, six mm-hmm. years older. Uh, so it's all black and white. Um, you know, whereas this is colorized and, and all that. Still a cheaper option. Like obviously, people were using color as early as the 1930s. Well, right. So yeah. black and white. It's still even today a cheaper option to go with like that's why a lot of indie directors for their first or second film will do black and white films now for uh rod taylor who played george did anybody else think he looked like a combination of bill pullman and robin williams no no is that just me (laughs) yeah i didn't No. okay sorry Uh, he did look abnormally handsome compared to his friends like his friends even Philby looked like they had, well, the other three guys looked like they had at least 20 years on him. And then Philby looked like he was seven or eight years. Philby kind of reminded me of Chief O'Brien, too. Oh, yeah. I kept thinking it was, like, related to Cole Meany. Um, <laughs> That's my headcanon now. Side note. That is that is a early ancestor of Chief O'Brien. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, like, I, I just can't imagine any time of, any period of time where four or five gentlemen that range in age so much get together on like a weekly basis for dinner. And drink wine. Yeah. Well, there wasn't much else well, to do. Well, that one guy was an alcoholic. Like, okay. he really? just <laughs> And I thought that, that was going to be relevant. Like, I thought it was going to yeah. be relevant because they really made a point to show this guy immediately said he always appreciated their uh, mm-hmm. wine or yeah, whatever. Never and it, yeah, and I it think never it was came because, around. Because, like, those three guys had nothing characteristic about them. So that guy's an alcoholic. That guy's always smoking a cigar, and that guy's playing with his monocle and saying, rah, 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 rah. like, so that, that was it. about right. Uh, yeah, Sixties yeah, character development. They were just there to doubt, and Philby was there to be the friend, is yeah. really what it was. Because the other three just kind of abandoned him, and Philby stays behind. For, like, that scene takes a little too long yeah. for George to realize that, that Philby's still the, there. <laughs> that was the most relevant part of it. Like, those three guys are the people in our Congress right now. They see something with their own eyes, and they're like, no, it didn't happen. Like, that is the most relevant thing about the movie. Derek, so Derek does not want to get political no, right no, now. No, so. no, no. I, that, was, um, that was just it. I'm just saying those but, guys are relatable because sure. it's what we see all the time. There are a couple of interesting things that we haven't touched on yet. There's the atomic wars of the mid-1960s, which, which of course, were in the future from when the movie was made. Um, which, you know, was kind of telling of the time, right? It was the heights of the Cold War and the Red Scare and those those sorts of things. Um, so that was kind of intense. I loved the um, mannequin aspect. I thought it was a little overused. I actually, yeah, I liked but, the mannequin too. I thought it was an interesting was, way yeah. of showing time progressing. Although there were some weird inconsistencies with the speed. Yeah. Like you could see it undress and get dressed, but it, this was like as the sun had passed like four times and they <laughs> just leave this mannequin naked for a week. You know, come on. Like there was some weird inconsistencies. I never. He just keeps moving the lever when he's right. on screen. Yeah. It, yeah. That's yeah. going to look really weird if he keeps going back and forth he with the lever like that. He did say that it was his ageless friend. <laughs> like, uh. See, that's the thing. Maybe that's why, like, creepy. the Aloy stuff with, um, uh... Eloy, not Yeah, I was going to say, we're getting what Horizon Zero Dawn right Aloy. now. Right, sorry, my bad. The, um... Eloy. Eloy. I'm all screwed up now. Uh, the Eloy stuff... We did it. We broke Derek. The Eloy stuff wasn't as creepy, because I thought the mannequin part was weird. No. <laughs> he's, he's like... He's a lonely guy. Yeah, guys, a... guys love sex dolls now. It's fine. <laughs> It, now I guarantee you that guy had one. It's that okay. Was the one. He would have invented one. It is legal to love sex dolls. It's never legal to love children. <laughs> like um, now there is when he goes to the future, nineteen sixty six. In the window is a TV, and it says the the first uh, tubeless television, and it actually looks a lot like the what first flat tubeless. screens you know turned yeah. out to be, which is kind of neat for nineteen sixty. Um, now there is something that a lot of people have gripes about in the sci fi community, and that's that there seems to be no point where we meet extraterrestrial life in those 800,000 years. Now, I don't think there's enough shown. Yeah, they skipped through like 600,000 years. Yeah. And like 
five minutes or okay. less. So yeah. Yeah, yeah, I don't really have a problem with that. Okay. I just wondered maybe how I was just making it. I mean, we could come up I mean, with some, some headcanon ha- where they create. Murlocs or yeah, whatever. Yeah. They look like they could be half alien. Yeah. So, you know, who knows? So, last fun bit of trivia if you're an X Men fan at all, the Morlocks are a subset of mutants in the X Men that are non human passing. So they live in the sewers, and they were named after, obviously, the time machine. And their leader, Caliban, was named after a deformed character in the uh, play The Tempest by Shakespeare. So uh, just for the entire story of the um, Morlocks in the X-Men, it's taken from sci-fi and fantasy and classical literature. So it's pretty cool. Nice, nice. Pretty cool homage. So we're kind of at our hour mark. Is there yeah. anything else you guys want to note about the film? No, I, I got to harangue it enough. That's very cool. Ryan? Nope, I'm not good about the okay. amount of haranguing I did. All right, yeah, cool. Right? Um, I will say, so I know, Ryan, you watched it on DVD. We watched the Blu-ray. It was like my first time watching it on Blu-ray. And the restoration was actually really good. It was nice. Um, I noted so... that right at the beginning. The color was great. Whoever oh. was responsible for doing the restoration did a good job. I did have something else. I learned today that even in 1899, people are assholes on New Year's Eve. Yeah, it was like middle of the day, and they're driving <laughs> by honking, and I was like, wait, is this supposed to be midnight? What? Well, look at it this way, okay? They had less to do back then. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to cut them a little slack. Rather well, they than, could uh, obviously be inventing time machines, so clearly. or making sex dolls. So we know what they did. Um, <laughs> Now you could you could you could extrapolate a little bit and say that he went he went back to the future not just of course to back be, to the future be with the uh, the Eloy but also to keep the time machine out of anybody's hands who would then turn it over to the military like his friends wanted him to do yeah and that would have had you know pretty catastrophic ramifications mm-hmm. so you could Absolutely. argue that that was his thing now in the book he doesn't go back to the Eloy yeah the Eloy damn it uh, he goes into the, he basically goes to the end of the earth. Yeah. Um, and there's like these giant bug like creatures and stuff like that. He and crabs of fighting giant butterflies. Yeah. So yeah. like you know, so I like that. I like the idea that he just kinda wants to see the end and that gave us absolutely one of my favorite episodes of Futurama of all time. Yes. Um, where he where the, the professor creates the forwards time machine and they can't go backwards, they keep looping around. It's beautiful, it's a wonderful episode. Can you remember the name of that one at all? I can't no. remember the name of it. Okay. But oh, well. it's in the final season and one of the best ever. But, uh, but okay. Well, that's it then. Um, Ryan will be picking our next Fill Our Holes retro review. I'm going to tell you that Derek and Rachel both picked... Well, Derek Derek floundered a little bit on his. He had a different movie pick, but he was like, Oh, guys, but it's not relevant enough to cinema, so we have to pick something else. I'm not floundering. I'm going to pick a movie that I like that you guys haven't seen. But you haven't picked it yet, so it sounds like you're still I have hunting. several in mind that I'm going to throw out to you guys well, at some point. Well, we're going to do this every month, them. so every three months it'll I be your turn. I get to tell you guys, yeah. or not. But, so yeah. you, you don't want to say what it is yet. I, mean, I don't, I've got a several. I need to find I made out you watch a good film, so, like, you did. come on. I think, you know, two-thirds, if two-thirds of our picks are good films, then, you know. Are you saying that mine was good? No, I'm saying that mine might be good. But you're saying you're trolling us. I didn't say I'd troll you. I said maybe I'd troll you. Uh, so maybe I'm trolling you by saying I'm going to troll you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Join us next week when we review season two of Iron Fist. Yes. And yeah. We'll talk news. It'll be great. And thanks to the like people that. in the chat. Yes. Yeah, thank we you had very a much. really good conversation this evening. Thank you to Midnight Pearl, Doc Rev, and D Girl eighty three. And uh, don't forget, guys, that if you join our Patreon, patreon.com slash heroes podcasts, uh, you can get exclusive access to our patron lounge on Slack, where all of the hosts on the HPN are there to just talk whatever. You don't have to talk about the shows. You can talk about whatever pop culture type stuff you want, as long as you're being cool and not being a jerk. So uh, we really want to get more people in there to have some conversation going because it's a little quiet at the moment. You can also request episode topics for yes. any of the podcasts, especially this one, considering how broad we are compared to some of the others. But we all pay attention to that. So Yeah, so please check that out. Uh, Ryan is at Buster Props. Mm-hmm. Yep, Instagram, Facebook. Buy his Shazam stuff. Yeah, or well, really anything. any of it. Yeah, I'm not anything. too picky. Yeah. But yeah, Shazam <laughs> stuff is cool too. It is. Right? 
I'm at Siren Ray. I spell it like the X Men S I R Y N on all the social media, the, the main three, and plus Patreon. So do your thing. Follow me too. That's fine if you don't. I don't really care. <laughs> And I am the Star Trek dude. I also co-host Red Shirts and Runabouts, which is our Star Trek podcast on Fridays. So please go ahead and check that out. You can find us at Heroes Podcasts on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitch. You can chat with us live Tuesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern, 8 Central on Twitch, just like everybody did here tonight. We really appreciate that. We'll catch you guys next time. Bye, guys.